Hi, Robert hier. Dieser Podcast wird euch präsentiert von der Hannover Messe. Wir sagen vielen herzlichen Dank an die Kollegen in Hannover und jetzt geht's los. Robotik in der Industrie. Der Podcast mit Helmut Schmidt und Robert Weber. Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of our Robotics Podcast. My name is Robert Weber. And we are back in the USA calling America with Stu. Stu, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me again. We have already discussed the topic of robotics as a service, I think, two episodes back. But today we want to go a little bit more in details. Stu, the USA, from my point of view, is a land of financial institutions. Many trends in banking and financing come from the USA. And you are now saying that robotics as a service is difficult in the USA. Why is that? Yeah, so it's oftentimes because there are so many different financial choices in the USA. And also our tax laws are different here than other countries. So a lot of other companies from other countries have looked at the USA and said, well, it should be easy to go robots as a service because they have software as a service from major software providers that we won't name by name, but most of us have their stuff running on our computers today. But the thing about robots as a service is it's not as easy and straightforward. I mean, it's certainly mm -hmm. attractive from the investor's point of view. It's attractive from the customers promoting it point of view or the resellers and, and integrators and everybody are selling it, you know, because it adds a services model. It is kind of a camouflage of a lease or a rent to own type situation. So it sounds simple and sounds easy. It creates reoccurring revenue, which is attractive. Mm -hmm. And the challenges start to get to be when you're talking about non-standard equipment, rental services and, and leasing services work best when it's something that's a fixed asset, it's like a, a car, you know, exactly. you go and rent a car or you lease a fork truck and it's got a durable life and you can pick it up and throw it on a flatbed and take it out. So all of that sounds good, right? And it's a, those are common business models in the U.S. and you think you can sure. just kind of latch onto that. But the issues start to come up when you start looking more deeply at what's happening with the solutions that are being sold. First off, the solutions are not necessarily easy to install. You just don't push them off of a truck and they start working. It's not a plug and play, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just not the case because you have to drill holes in the concrete. You have to install them. You have to add utilities. Sometimes there's on-site integration and other work that has to be done. And that's non-reoccurring mm -hmm. and typically doesn't get captured in the lease because that's, that's labor. And it's other services that go into it. And then when you get to that stage, you hope that the terms have been reviewed carefully to make sure that the specifications and the expectations for performance are well in place and well documented and the system is proven, which makes, again, custom integration difficult because the system should have already passed a factory acceptance test before it was shipped. Mm -hmm. And then once it's shipped and installed, it has to pass a site acceptance test before the lease is technically able to be executed. So that whole time, the customer's like, hey, I'm not going to pay for this until it's running. Exactly. Which is, I agree, right? And then likewise, once it's running, you know, what do you do about other things that wind up having to be done, like maintenance? You know, maintenance on a fork truck or a car is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. With a system, it may vary because of the type of system and how does that get taken care of? Is that part of the lease or not, or part of the rent or not? So, but you are now talking about robot arms. What about AGVs and AMRs? Isn't that easier? Yeah, they're certainly easier, and and there's certainly you know, you're managing a fleet, and yep. and the units may not be as customized as a robot because you know they can do a job without having a lot of special tooling added to them or the tooling is transportable and it can be, you know, dropped on and dropped off type of thing. So yeah, that may still work. But even with that, the challenge gets to be is at the end of the day, any automation job is a financial decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's technology involved and yes, there's all these other things that have to happen. But once the system is competent and capable of making rate and quality, At that point in time, it all comes about the financing. 
And to your point, there's lots of choices when you get to the United States. So along with those choices, there's risks. And the, the cost and relative value of those choices can be judged in financial terms from a risk perspective. So let's say the integrator is the organization that's doing the leasing and they're saying, hey, buy this or lease this system or use it as a system as a service or a robot as a service, pay us and we'll do a subscription and you run the system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all great until something goes wrong, like the customer changes their mind about their business and sends the stuff back. Then you have to figure out how to redeploy this somewhat customized system. The other challenge is collections. A lot of companies don't like reoccurring fees yeah. because on the balance sheet, it still shows as a liability. And again, back to the financial side, you would have had to have, in the U.S., you file what's called a UCC1 uh, document that validates that the integrator or the producer or the owner of the system still owns it, even though it's on somebody else's floor. Well, the second you execute a UCC-1 and post it, it shows as a liability against the company, and it's a publicly viewable thing. So if that company is working on getting financing, your robot as a service or system as a service is out there visible to the marketplace, that there's a liability there. But what is your opinion? Why do international companies and investors believe that the robotic as a service model will work in the U.S. market? Because do they don't listen to you as an expert? No, I think it's it's everybody wants to try something and there's nothing wrong with trying it. It's just we're far enough into the market now after, you know, people trying to do it for arguably more than 10 years. I think we're deep enough into the market that they've got some experience. Plus, for an international company, it looks good if you can move it to your U.S. subsidiary and have your U.S. subsidiary take care of all the risk. Mm -hmm. But robots as a service for something that's exported from one country to another is difficult because you're record of import and ownership. And yep. again, what do you do when you have to go take the system out? What do you do if the customer fails and doesn't stay alive? What does the customer do if the robot as a service or the system as a service company fails or sells your lease? You know, suddenly you're, you're out of control along with the complications that many times you monitor the system's health through an internet connection. And again, a lot of companies are reluctant to add that idea of being plugged into the cloud and all the issues that go on with cybersecurity and these kinds of things. So I think what started out as a clever idea and maybe something interesting and say, hey, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, must be a duck, by comparing <laughs> it to automobiles and fork trucks and other things like that, I think was, wasn't necessarily true. But is it is the problem the robotic as a service model or is it a fundamental problem with the business? In my mind, it's a, it's a business issue Okay. because there's fundamentals that are not addressed. And again, a lot of companies don't like reoccurring fees, yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. like connectivity to the cloud. They don't like the risk of what happens if something goes sideways in the deal. So all these risks and most companies make either no decision or change their decision away from robots as a service. And you're seeing it because there's companies that have been robots as a service that have been failing. And there's been some just in the last two months. And then likewise, they're finding out that the equipment is not as marketable as they thought when they tried to move it from one client to another client. What about the banks? What is their opinion? So the bank's opinion varies depending on the relationship they have with the customer. Mm -hmm. So if the customer already has debt, already owes the bank money, Oftentimes, the bank has first call on, is that organization allowed to borrow from somebody else? Because they don't want to have their risk diluted by some other financier getting into that particular company. They want to make sure they're secure. So some banks will actually prohibit customers from going out and doing robots as a service or other types of subordinate financing. The other thing is, is that the rates that are being offered by the service providers or the robot system providers may not be competitive mm -hmm. to just straight out leasing. And in fact, if they're just fronting a bank, you know, bank rates are still going to be better. So sometimes, especially with larger companies, larger companies have their own lease access that is more financially beneficial than robots as a service without all the other tentacles grabbing hold of them that they don't want to have to deal with. We know, we know that from the forklift market, right? 
Yes, yes. And then the other thing is the tax laws here are different, um, you know, directly related to the banking issue. Mm -hmm. So when you acquire a piece of capital equipment, you depreciate it against your taxes and you can write it off over three to five years, whatever the useful life of that asset is by the IRS rules. But there's a special clause in the U.S. that's IRS Section 179, which allows you with if you have the right profitability in the company, it allows you to purchase capital equipment. And as long as it's installed by December 31st of the year of your taxes that you're doing, you can write off that piece of equipment a hundred percent in wow. one shot and not spread it out over five years. That's interesting. Yeah. And a lot of companies that aren't used to doing business in the States and don't understand the tax side of the business um, don't realize that that's out there. And that's one of the reasons that in the fourth quarter in the United States, there's more capital equipment purchased in the fourth quarter than any other quarter. Because companies are looking to say, gee, what's my profitability and what's my budget that I've got in my system for CapEx? And can I spend it and can I write it all off in one shot? So you see a, a significant increase in drive to sell equipment in the fourth quarter, which also goes along with why the trade shows are in the fourth quarter. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons, especially in capital equipment, like machine tools and that kind of thing. At IMTS and, and Fabtech and Pack Expo, the three big shows this fall, people are lined up ready to spend money, trying to get it in before December 31st to take advantage of the tax situation. Mm -hmm. So robotic as a service will never come. I don't know that it will never come. There's, you know, I never say never because, you know, <laughs> there's always been issues, but it's a, it's a long shot at best. And then sometimes the companies that are, they're trying to do robots as a service, it's their last gasp at trying to get some kind of money if they don't have good financial backing. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is a risk. And again, we've had a number of companies that have evaporated lately that, you know, have failed. So, I personally believe, and there's evidence to support it, that robot as a service is a, we'll call it a fad. You know, it was an experiment. Um, the experiment has arguably not been successful or otherwise you see a lot more of it. But the other side of it is there's an opportunity. If people understand how to deliver the equipment and fit inside of all the rules and all the options, then you might be successful. So if you have a piece of automation robot, AMR, whatever, that can be highly standardized and can be moved from company to company easily and can be, in fact, pushed off a truck and just started up and go. And there are systems out there that do that. There's a number of small cobot arc welding systems and other systems now that, in fact, are that way. So if you can get it to that stage, then, yeah, it's possible. But robot as a service has to be competitive with all the other financial choices that the customer has or restrictions that the customer has. So do you see other markets in the world where it can work, for example, in, in Europe or Asia? So I'm not familiar with their tax codes and yeah. things that go on there. The other thing is, depending on the size of the company and the country and where everything's located, it may be difficult to manage the differences in the laws. Because anytime you're doing cross-border work from one country to another, you have to pay very close attention to uh, the international commercial issues. So, it, like I said, it's nothing is impossible. The question is, is it low enough risk for the customer to say yes without everything else getting in the way? And mm -hmm. there's more customers that decide not to do something because of risk than any other reason for not automating. So how do you make it easy for the customer? How do you make it easy to protect from the Internet issues? How do you make it easy to manage so that everybody's happy? And right now, most companies offering robots as a service, while it sounds good, has not been practical or not lived up to its ease of use business model. And do you think that maybe AMRs, AGV, will be the first applications when it comes to robotics as a service? So they wouldn't be the first because robots as a service have been out there before there was AMRs all over the place. Yeah, uh, um, and people have but leaped. Maybe beneficial. Yeah, it may be beneficial again because you're working with a product that's a highly standardized product, and there's multiples of them. You know, there's copies, and some warehouses could have, you know, ten to a hundred of them, and that makes that kind of attractive. So that's a possibility. Plus, 
you do have evolving software consistently in an AMR system because you're adding new SKUs to the system on a regular basis. You're adding all kinds of other stuff on a frequent basis that may require touches from the outside. Likewise, AI-enabled systems may be able to have subscription services that are somewhat like robots as a service, but more like service as a service, it's a subscription, uh, for making incremental improvements in the system. Because one of the benefits of cloud computing and AI is big data. Yep. And big, big data may not necessarily always be on-prem at the customer. Exactly. And then likewise, the customer may not have the ability to assimilate all the data and work the models and those kinds of things. But again, that's a maybe it's a periodic connection. Maybe it's monthly, quarterly, annually. You know, that's something that could work. But what do your customers want when it comes to to finance a robot? They want to pay cash, or what is what is? <laughs> yeah, good question. It depends on on their culture. Sometimes there are some groups of people that actually prefer to buy in cash, but that's difficult to do. Yes. But yeah, they want a transaction that's simple that's easy to manage, that doesn't have a lot of thought behind it. They don't want something they have to worry about every single month from a cash flow perspective. So it's really about making the financial people happy because, again, I'll go back to one of my earlier statements. No matter how cool the technology is or how much the benefit may be perceived of having subscriptions and other things like that, it's just more work to do monthly and, and all the invoicing and Payments and collections and, you know, what happens when collections go sideways. All of those are, are issues that customers prefer not to deal with. And I've talked mm -hmm. to big companies and small from, you know, major corporations to small mom and pop shops. And none of them like to deal with a reoccurring mm -hmm. fee yep. or subscriptions or anything that's outside of their scope of control. And the more risk adverse they are, again, the less likely they are to say yes. So what is your advice to the robotics companies? Well, if they're, if they're serious about, you know, work on, on not only the content of the system to solve the customer's problem, that's the first thing, of course. You've got to make sure it works. Yeah, sure. But secondly, how do you make it modular and easy from an installation, deinstallation point of view so you don't lose time, money, and effort taking things in and out? And is there a CapEx model that works as an option for the customer And then you offer still robots as a service. You let the customer make that decision. I think that's a pragmatic way to approach it. But it also they need to recognize and, and interview and talk to their customers about the financial side to understand it before they make an offer. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times systems integrators, robot companies, et cetera, they're all about the technology. They'll talk about technology all day long. And they'll talk about return on investments and speed and throughput and all this other kind of stuff, but they don't talk about the commercial impact. Yeah. And I strongly encourage that to happen because most of the time the customers, when they have not decided to do something and the selling company is frustrated because they can't get an answer, it's actually because the selling company hasn't asked the right question mm -hmm. and solved the right problem that the customer is most worried about. It's just noise. And you've got to really pay attention to the whole customer, not just the technical side or the throughput side of what they're trying to achieve in the plan, because it's a financial deal. Stu, thank you very much for your insight about the U.S. market when it comes to robotics as a service. Thank you very much and all the best and greetings to the USA. Thanks. Appreciate your time and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.